it again. We have here a really unique gathering here of, of uh, five women data scientists in, in one room. This is, um, as I will, uh, I think you may understand, it's a pretty rare event. We have a uh, newly launched Master of Information and Data Science program here. We have 120 students enrolled at the moment. Less than 20% are women. And so we have to solve this problem. And I want, I want to talk to this group of women about both what they're doing as data scientists and what we can do as a community to build the representation of women in data science. So I, again, I want to uh, thank Eric and Paul at Bayes Impact for bringing us this amazing team of women. Uh, so I am going to have them each introduce themselves. Uh, and the first question that I've asked them each to speak just briefly about is what is their current job? Um, where, you know, where do they work? How did they get there? And what do they, you know, just describe a bit about what you do day to day, okay? Uh, and we're gonna start with Vesela Gateva, who is the senior data scientist event, at Eventbrite. Hi, everybody. Um, so I started, I'll start with my education. My background is uh, um, in mathematics, and I also have a master's in biostatistics. Um, I went through um, a few different industries. My first job was um, at a biotech company where I was doing research in computational genetics. Then I switched to uh, finance, um, where I worked for a little bit on uh, credit risk consulting. And then I ended up in the tech industry um, at Eventbrite. Um, what I do day to day is mostly building predictive models um, that are used by the various departments of the company. Um, I also do um, forecasting for um, the, fi the finance department, and um, I have also done a little bit of uh, infrastructure work uh, uh, building um, MySQL uh, tables and database. Great, thank you. Next we have Catherine Matsumoto, who is a senior data, uh, data, scientist, product, data scientist in product intelligence at salesforce.com. Catherine. Hi. So. Um, my background is I did my undergrad at Stanford University, um, then worked in advertising, which has absolutely nothing related to doing data. Don't, I was working in like the art side. <laughs> um, realized that I sort of missed the technical aspects of my undergraduate degree and went back to do a master's in analytics. So I was part of the first sort of analytics program at Northwestern University. Um, I have, while there I worked on a number of you know, hands-on projects with local companies, as well as working part-time for Braintree. Um, I, it's now a subsidiary of PayPal. Um, they also run, ha, run Venmo, for those of you who know the, uh, that app. Uh, so I was doing data science for them. Um, and now I am at Salesforce. Um, I work on the product side of analytics, so um, both product strategy, you know, how can, which features should we be prioritizing to, you know, better engage the end users as well as um, sort of the intelligence that actually is built into the product. Um, and it, it's a good amount of uh, counting <laughs> and uh, sort of you know, data cleaning, but as well as um, my personal interest is in more of the unsupervised um, exploration and sort of how can you identify personas and patterns of behavior across a very diverse user base um, and use that to segment uh, the customers. Excellent. Oh, and I'm also, I know it was mentioned earlier, I'm also a, a volunteer chapter leader for DataKind, which, similar to Bay's Impact, is a nonprofit um, aimed at connecting uh, data scientists to uh, do projects with, par partnered with uh, local nonprofits. And if people are interested in getting involved with DataKind, what should they do? Uh, we have a website, a meetup group. Uh, it's, you can look for datakind.org as our sort of the home uh, website, but um, we have an SF chapter right here. We'll, planning on having our first public event at the end of September. So join the meetup group and you'll get all of the announcements. Great, thank you. Okay, Elena Gruel, data scientist, Airbnb. Great, um, so it's great to be here. Uh, I've been at Airbnb for about two and a half years now. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Airbnb is an online marketplace for accommodations where people can list spaces they have available and other people can search and find those places. Uh, my background before Airbnb was actually as a PhD student at Stanford in the School of Education. Uh, I was building predictive models of friendship, so studying 
adolescent friendship networks in schools, and I was really interested in when students made friends with those who were different from themselves, so from a different socioeconomic background or racial background, and what kind of structures in the school might facilitate greater diversity. Um, and so it, it actually ended up being a great skill set for data science, kind of strangely enough. So I had to do quite a bit of programming to build the models. And um, obviously, you know, they were predictive models, lots of statistics, a lot of data cleaning, um, and you know, interested in people from different backgrounds interacting, which is actually a lot of what Airbnb is about. Um, and so I came to Airbnb. Uh, when I first started, I was an individual contributor. Uh, there were about four of us on the team. And I did a lot of work on actually optimizing our operations. We were growing very quickly, and we had a huge operational arm. And so a lot of my work was running experiments and um, kind of helping with strategic discussions. Uh, and then I moved into a management role, and I actually now lead a team of nine data scientists. And um, my team is responsible for basically the online and the offline experience of the user. So uh, we do work like, for example, optimizing the search ranking. So when you do a search, what listings show up. Uh, lots of predictive modeling around things like what hosts are likely to deactivate their listing, um, what predicts someone coming back to rebook on Airbnb, how can we inform product decisions. Um, with that kind of data, uh, we helped build out our experimentation platform. Um, it's definitely a mix of some engineering and also statistics. And uh, actually now I do a lot of um, recruiting and interviewing and helping to build the team. So that's another big part of the job. We'll welcome you back so. to that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, now we have Pinar Donmez, who is the Chief Data Scientist at Cabbage Inc. Yes. Uh, hello, you all, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm the Chief Data Scientist at Cabbage. We are a data and technology company in the lending space. We uh, loan money to small and medium businesses in the U.S. And um, I have a, a small team of data scientists. We are working a lot on credit risk modeling, uh, fraud detection, um, we do a lot. Uh, we do a lot of uh, data analytics work uh, related to other departments within the company, whether it is marketing to understand where sh our marketing dollars should go, or uh, with the collections and payment department to understand which e-checks are likely to decline, uh, which customers we should collect from, and when and how much, and so on. There is a lot of data-driven decisions that ev almost every department within the company has to make. And that's where we um, come into place. Uh, before then, um, I, was, um, I was a PhD student at uh, the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. I got my PhD. I was very academic focused, so I uh, decided to be in a research lab after graduation. I went to Yahoo Research. I was working a lot on query optimization, uh, query ranking, uh, customer intention, understanding, text summarization. And then I went to Salesforce. Um, as opposed to you, uh, you were on the product intelligence, I was on the customer intelligence. So we were doing a lot of customer attrition prediction, churn prediction, um, propensity to buy estimation and so on to, for upsell and cross-sell opportunities. And I was making my making my way down and I ended up in uh, at Cabbage, which is, a, which is a lot smaller company. Excellent. And last but certainly not least, Amy Namura, who's a data scientist at Jawbone. Hey, guys. Um, let's see, where do I start? I'll give you the short version. I got my PhD in neuroscience and then um, went on to Berkeley, actually, to do my postdoc in uh, Mark Desposito, Desposito's lab, who does functional neuroimaging. So I was really interested to hear more about the Parkinson's predictive uh, clinical markers work, since that's not exactly the same as my research, but related. Um, I was doing some clustering analysis of um, MRI data on patients who'd had a stroke or some sort of brain tumor. So those kind of data, data science skills, I guess at the time, I didn't think of them that way. They were just sort of the, the skills I needed to do my research. Um, came in handy as I moved into the um, non-academic space. I started at a startup um, two and a half years ago. Uh, I ended my postdoc and um, worked for this about 100-person startup doing social, um, social media for enterprise, so helping um, insurance agents use social media. And they needed a data scientist who had some sort of experience um, dealing with messy data and MRI data certainly is that. Um, so 
I worked there for about a year and a half, and it was really um, a great learning experience just working um, at a company, um, learning about what it is to be a data scientist. I think um, that's sort of a role that's like changing a lot, and we'll probably get into that a little bit, I would imagine. Um, and then I guess I've been at Jawbone almost a year now, and in case um, you haven't heard of Jawbone, they make these handy little um, activity tracking bracelets, and uh, we're originally a Bluetooth speaker company, um, but it uses the same sort of Bluetooth technology. Um, and I'm on the data science team there where we um, are responsible for a bunch of different things. Um, we're a pretty small team, but we do both product um, features, so in the app, um, I recently worked on a project that helps uh, make food logging more efficient. So if you had a hamburger, it'll suggest like, hey, did you also have french fries? Um, <laughs> these are the very impactful data science um, things that I'm building. Uh, we also, though, recently, you guys might have seen, um, we released a blog post just after the earthquake um, just showing how up users were awake, uh, the closer they were to the epicenter. You know, nothing groundbreaking, but um, it's kind of cool to be able to use data science. And, and we put that blog out like 12 hours after the earthquake. We were all like furiously doing SQL queries. Um, so it's kind of cool to be able to do something that's, that touched so many people. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, that's my journey. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, we're going to turn this around and start with you this time. Okay. So I want to, first, the next question is how many, what's the ratio of women to men? in your data science team, and what would you do to, what, what do you think um, you could do or a school like Berkeley could do to change that? Okay, let's see. So at Jawbone, it's pretty low in general for, for especially on the engineering side, uh, the ratio. On my team, my manager is actually female, which is pretty rare. I think she's the, there's only two female VPs at Jawbone. Um, her name's Monica Rigatti. She's kind of a, a data, data science scientist. superstar. <laughs> she was at LinkedIn for a long time. Um, so she's been a great mentor for me. And I think that's one thing that um, hopefully all of us someday can do for other fledgling men and women um, data scientists um, is just to be a good example and just show people, you know, you can do it. Um, it's, I don't know. I don't exactly know like the right way to solve this problem. Um, I guess part of it is just getting more women into sort of technical fields early on. Um, so that falls kind of in like education. Um, <laughs> uh, I think like having more recruiting events and like, um, I don't know, meetups and things like that, making it more female friendly. Sometimes I go to meetups about like, you know, some big data technology and I'm like literally the only female in the room and it's just, awkward. Um, <laughs> I want to like put on a disguise or something because I don't want to talk about necessarily like what it is to be female. I just want to like get into the nerdy stuff. So yeah. Great. Thanks. That's helpful. Pinar. Um, so I guess that at my current company it's about uh, for data science one third. One I would say, okay. yeah. Um, but I'm in a, a special environment. I would say we have three co-founders. One of them is female, um, we have another C-level executive who is female. Um, so there is a sort of a strong female presence <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the current company that I'm in. But uh, I agree with, uh, with Amy as well. It's usually a, a, a not a common situation to, uh, to usually see a lot of women. Not, in, not only in data science, in engineering as well. I remember from my older days, I was usually the only woman in the room as well, in meetings as well. Um, what, how we can solve it is a sort of a very broad uh, question with a lot of, uh, which should touch a lot of aspects, I think. I agree with Amy that if there are a lot of role models that you can look up to, a lot of successful uh, people who are in those positions that can uh, that you can look up to, I think it is a sort of uh, is a very appealing, uh, appealing thing to have. But uh, more important than that, I think one of the biggest aspects, at least for me, is uh, as a woman knowing that the, there are a lot of opportunities and 
uh, different problems to work on. I think that's more important than having role models. Because when you know that there is a number of um, opportunities to apply data science or machine learning or other engineering skills into very different problems, like Paul and Eric was mentioning, and I'm an advisor to Base Impact as well. And one of the uh, sort of uh, one of my early, earlier conversations with Paul, he asked me at the end, like, so okay, are you interested? And uh, the answer I gave him was, well, how can I not be? Because uh, in what in what other area I can have the chance to work with so diverse set of problems like uh, Parkinson's disease, kidney transplant. They have other um, problems working with um, parole. Uh, people who are in prison uh, and who sh you should uh, prioritize on parole so that they won't do anything bad and end up in jail again and so on. So they have a very, very sort of unusual diverse set of problems that uh, if as a woman, if you know that there is a variety of things to work on, I'm sure that you are going to find something that would be interesting to you. So that I think that's, for me at least, is one of the biggest drivers. That's great. So this is just listen up, women. <laughs> there are great opportunities to do really interesting stuff in data science. Yeah. There are some successful role models here too, by the way. That's why we have you here. OK, um, Elena. Yeah, um, so I think. I definitely agree with what's been said already. Um, certainly having women who are successful in the field is helpful. And um, How many women are there in Oh, women. Team? So on my team of nine, there's one other woman. Uh, but I think it's like 20% total on the team. Um, so probably par for the course, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you know, definitely having been on the side of you know, reviewing candidates and interviewing, um, certainly getting more people with the right skill set would be really helpful. <laughs> like there's definitely you know, a lot of desire to hire diverse candidates. It's just difficult to kind of find them. Um, and I think one thing that has been great at Airbnb is our, our recruiters are really dedicated to like, thinking about diversity and you know, making sure that um, you know, we're, we're giving everyone a fair chance and including as many people as we can in the process. Um, and then the other thing that I also think has been really great is actually the support of the male leaders on my team as well, which has been really awesome. So uh, I organized a dinner for women in data science, um, kind of coming back to what Emmy mentioned, where you know often you'll go to meetups or conferences and be the only woman. And so that's one way to kind of have a room filled with women who are doing the same work. Um, and everyone was so excited about this. They thought it was so great. They really encouraged it. Um, and so that, that was really wonderful. So I think that's also a big part of it too, is having a, a community of people who are really excited about diversity and find it to be important. Great. So. Excellent. So on my team, sort of on our core team of 12, um, I am the only woman. And then I'm the only woman going all the way up the chain to the CEO. Um, <laughs> So I'm, uh, I work with a lot of partners um, sort of on the product, product management side or on the design side. Um, that, so there, there are more women. Um, for me, the biggest thing is finding other women outside of what I do day to day to sort of bounce ideas off of in terms of like, all the problems I face have really like, when it comes to sort of gender problems are the same ones that are faced by people in sales and marketing. Like there is a much larger problem um, in terms of sort of women's interactions in the workplace, I think it just gets brought out a lot more on the technical side, um, at least from my perspective as someone who uh, went into college with a very strong um, math and science background, but was very quickly, felt like I was funneled into more of a social science track. Maybe that's because where I got the encouragement, but um, I had read something once, you know, it's. You know, women are more likely to go where they, you know, someone tells them, oh, you're really good at this, you know, keep going. Um, whereas, you know, guys are more likely to say, well, I really like this, I'm, I'm gonna keep doing this. Um, so I think one of the best things that every single person in this room can do right now is go, you know, volunteer at an elementary school or a middle school and, you know, work with hosting science fairs or, uh, you know, getting women and young, or not women, but young girls involved in doing, you know, building things. That's where I got most of my skills is my dad's a programmer, so we would take stuff apart uh, when I was a kid. I was, I've been building websites for my whole thing. Now my websites had a lot of ponies and pink and glitter. Um, they didn't look anything like the websites that a lot of other people were using, but that was what was interesting to me then, and I could, sh you know, to what Peanut said, 
show them how that this skill set can be used for something they're interested in. Um, and you know, it starts early on. It's not just about what we're doing now, because uh, I think when you know we're doing a lot, it, it's getting that funnel all the way up from you know the six and seven year olds, because um, that's really where we're losing a lot of interest in uh, technical fields. Okay, last but not least, Priscilla. Um, so we have our analytics team is about seven, eight people. I'm the only woman uh, woman data scientist on the team, and we have another woman who's an analyst. All our uh, managers are uh, male. Um, I agree with everything that has been said so far. It's very important to have um, great role models, to have the exposure of what's out there and you could do. Um, I think personally for myself, and I think what should be important for everybody else is uh, you should, once you have a very genuine curiosity in a quantitative field or anything science related, I think you should just um, let your curiosity be, be your main guidance. Um, and you shouldn't think that, that you're a woman. Um, I never aspired to be a data scientist. It was a very, <laughs> it's a very recent term. Um, I just ended up being one, and all I knew, uh, I wanted to apply my quantitative skills um, solving interesting problems. I worked in various industries, and I've always, it's always been the same job, applying the same skills. And I've always been genuinely interested in what I did. I, uh, um, besides that, I also think that women in general uh, probably uh, tend to give themselves less credit than uh, they deserve. Um, and I think what women should know is that once they have the curiosity and the basic fundamentals of probability and statistics, computer science, machine learning, they can figure out the rest on their own. Um, you already have the um, great base that you learned in school, and you can't know everything. There are so many tools out there, so many um, algorithms that you can use, because the number of problems are, is just limitless. Uh, but knowing the basics, you just have to take a leap of faith and believe in yourself that once you're presented with a problem that you've never seen before, you can just figure it out on your own. You can do a little bit of research, you can read a few papers online, talk to a few people, you should never be afraid to ask for help, and you'll just figure it out, and you'll be great at it. Awesome pep talk. I, I will say <laughs> we were talking beforehand about, about one of the things that really characterizes this field is everything's changing. You know, it's changing fast. So whatever we teach in our courses and in programs is probably not gonna be what we'll be teaching in five years. I mean, some of the conceptual foundations will be the same, but certainly the tools are changing. Mm -hmm. So having a lot of creativity and willingness to learn as you go is going to be very important. So I'm going to open this up for questions. So I want people in the audience to start thinking about questions you have for the panel. But before this, I have one more question. I want um, the panelists to say, what do you like least about your job and what do you love the most about your job? Just what is it like to be a data scientist? Is it just all that munging of the data that's really a <laughs> headache? Or what, what are the headaches and what are the joys of being in, in this job? Who wants to start? I can go. Yeah. Um, let's see. I can start with the, what I like the least. Um, I think it's kind of like, like I, describing my job to people at my job. Like there's a lot of misconceptions about what the team is. Like some people think, oh, you guys just like count up, you know, the number of users we have. Like, does it take a whole team of PhDs to do this? <laughs> like, no. Um, some people think that we just like build graphics on the website. Like. In some cases, yes, like I did implement a D3 interactive visualization of a feature that I built, but I also built the feature. Um, so there's always this sense of, I almost feel like defensive when somebody says like, oh, you're on the data science team, you must do blah. I'm ready to be like, no, actually. So, um, but it's not always like that. I'm, I'm like looking in the crowd for my one coworker. I don't know if he's here, but. Um, so I think that's just like educating people about what data science is um, and like, you know, your program hopefully is getting people there. I think in general, like the world needs to know what data science is. But um, what I like the most about my job, I think, is just like the creativity that I get to just every single problem is different. Every single um, project I work on is totally new and like there's certainly some overlap like there's a lot of data cleaning. Yes, everything involves data cleaning, but sometimes that data cleaning is totally different from the last thing. Like the thing I'm doing now, I'm trying to like categorize 
what is a hamburger? So it's like <laughs> hamburger, hamburgers, like double quarter pounder, all these, you know, and it's like a really kind of interesting cleaning problem, but it is a cleaning problem. Um, so and yeah, I guess just creativity. Problem. What? Classification and cleaning. Yes. yes. Great, thanks. You know. Um, gosh, uh, I have to, um, I had to sleep on this question, I guess, before answering. Um, I think that the, the thing that I most like about what I do is, uh, is the never-ending learning process. Uh, like, every, like we have been say, uh, saying so far, there's always something new. And it, you always feel like you are behind. Um, because there's some other language uh, that uh, some people have come up with. There's a new tool, uh, some other platform that is faster than the one that you are using right now. So I always feel like I'm still at school, uh, which, I, which I have a love and hate relationship <laughs> after being at school for so many years. Um, but I, uh, nevertheless, I think that's the part that I like the most because um, you always um, have to push yourself to learn, to learn new things and to to be um, to be ahead, because I think that's very important. The uh, the one thing that I like um, uh, least about is I think kind of the opposite of what you said because in my experience at least there is. Um, not the question of, oh, you do uh, graphs and uh, or uh, sort of uh, nice visuals, but it's kind of the opposite. The expectations are really high. You, I, I get questions, I get asked questions of really hypothetical uh, in nature and very sort of open-ended. And people uh, see it as a way, oh, like you, you know how to deal with it, just go ahead and um, so, solve it without, uh, without enough descriptions, without enough um, uh, explanation of what the end goal is. And they kind of have the expect, oh, we have the data. You, you can just tell me uh, what I'm looking for. But in a lot of cases, you don't really know what you are looking for, especially in a sort of abundance of large scale data. Uh, I think that's sort of, um, that's the expectation and the mindset. And it's partially, I think, our fault that we sort of, um, uh, sort of come up with this very loaded term that is nowadays is uh, pretty much everything and nothing at the same time. So I think that's sort of um, uh, the gap between what we understand from data science as data scientists and what everybody understands from data science and trying to bridge that gap and try to educate people, I think, is the hardest part of my job. So the expectations are way out yeah. of line with what yeah. kind of problems you really can solve. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in terms of things I like the most about my job, um, I think definitely being able to answer really interesting questions and actually make a difference is really cool. So for example, Airbnb has a review system where a guest reviews a host and a host reviews them back. And the way that it used to work was if I left a review for you, you could see it and then leave your review for me. And so we got complaints from people saying that when they had a bad experience, they felt like they couldn't write an honest review because they were worried that the person would kind of retaliate back against them. Um, and so we kind of saw that in our data and we suggested changing the system so that when I leave a review for you, you can't see it until you leave one back for me. And so it's like a little change, but we ran it as an experiment and it was really interesting to see the results. And one of the kind of unexpected results was that our review rates skyrocketed because people wanted to see what the other person had written about them. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, in all the time there are these like really amazing insights about how people behave and how we can like improve experiences. And it's really fun to kind of take the leap from doing the research to actually having an impact. Um, and then also just, I love my team. So that's, that's also a great thing about it. Uh, in terms of my least favorite part of the job, um, I think kind of related to there being so many cool things is that there is a limited amount of time. And so you have to really prioritize and figure out how you're gonna spend your time. And so that can be definitely a challenge. And there are a long list of things that I wish that I had time to do and I can't get to it. But you know, maybe someday. <laughs> so <laughs> anyways, it's, it's a good problem to have, I think. But it definitely is a challenge and can make it a little frustrating sometimes. Um, so I think for me, the it's, it's sort of a similar theme for, I'm gonna start with the, the thing I like least. Uh, 
is similar theme in that like people think we're doing magic um, <laughs> sometimes. They're like, they send like a one-line email and think they're going to get, I don't know what exactly they think they're going to get, that I'm going to be able to read their mind through the internet and also magically produce a result for them by their meeting in two hours. Um, <laughs> which is sort of you know, a misconception about you know, what we can do, what we can do, um, and the time it takes to do a lot of this stuff, um, and also the information that like, they need to provide. Um, it's a data literacy or a data education, not just you know, for me when I'm learning how to do these things or figuring out the problems that need to be solved. It's also that you know, other people um, really need to be also putting in the work to figure out how to ask good questions or you know, figure out where they can do impact because if they ask me to go down you know, a rabbit hole, um, but it's not actually what they wanted to learn, and then we sort of have to try and align. Um, so trying to catch us earlier and sort of spending a lot of time talking about um, the problems and sort of repeating the same question of why do you want to know that? Um, and I'm a, whereas what I like is really the hands-on um, aspect and getting to uh, getting to build things or you know work on uh, sort of providing new perspective a lot of times the data tells people things they already know because we do a lot of uh, user interviews and get a lot of feedback um, but sometimes it tells them things that they didn't already know um, and then they go back to interview users it's like they're like oh yeah like I just didn't think about that so uh, we all as humans like have limited capacity of memory so I think it's really cool to find the pieces of sort of user behavior, so it's you know like in a click path, um, you know it's like what's the likelihood that someone's going to click on you know, you know one particular object versus another. Um, Salesforce, is, in case any of you haven't used it, it's a bit of a confusing uh, place to <laughs> to uh, be using as a consumer. Um, <laughs> I use it every day, <laughs> and sometimes I get confused. Um, but you know, you have expectations of behavior, and then you have the data, and so sort of putting those pieces together and experimenting on it, and um, you know, finding where they don't match, and then working with. I really like working with the user research teams to figure out like why, why is this? I'm seeing this. Someone explain it to me. Solving problems. Yes, yeah. understanding behaviors really for me. It's, um, yeah, I'll have to agree with uh, um, a lot of the things that were already said. I would say one of the least, um, one of my least uh, favorite parts of the job is setting the right expectations and communicating with the other teams and the time it takes to uh, solve a specific problem. And um, you have to sometimes push back and tell people that what they're expecting is just not realistic. They have no idea what is actually to work with the actual data um, and how messy the data that we have is and how long it takes to clean it and to come up with some answer. Um, so yeah, that's the least favorite part. And the, my most favorite part of the job is definitely the um, continuous learning. Like you get uh, such a huge range of problems and most of the time you've never answered a similar problem uh, question before and you have to sit down and learn something new. I love reading papers, so every <laughs> chance to learn to read a paper and uh, learn something new is great. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for all these really fascinating uh, reflections. Now I'd like to open this up and see what questions you in the audience have. If you raise your hand, Tia will bring you the microphone. We have this amazing panel. Yeah. Tia, right over here. It's great to be sitting here and listening to all of you. Um, so you all mentioned the, the large range of problems that you work on. Um, do you need a great depth of domain knowledge to work on these problems, or are they all you know, related to the same domain? Jump in. I, I can start, I guess, because that um, uh, very much relates to the questions that I was asking myself when I accepted, uh, when I was considering the job offer from Cabbage, because it's in the financial domain, and risk was an area that I have never been exposed to before, not in, not in my PhD life, not even after. 
and um, I was debating with myself whether I have um, I have the right skills to be successful in in that role, um, and I finally decided to sort of take the challenge, and I said if I if I don't know it, I will go ahead and learn. Um, I was partially right and wrong um, for different reasons. I guess that a lot of the problems that um, even though the domain is risk and it's a highly regulated uh, field and there's a number of um, considerations with respect to time, seasonality and other things that you don't normally think in maybe in social data or in a sort of uh, in the consumer world. Um, although despite those differences, I think that the heart of the problem is not that different whether it's from classification or clustering or other sort of typical predictive learning uh, scenarios in machine learning. That, for that aspect, I think I, I, I was right. But for other aspects, I think that that domain knowledge uh, can be attained uh, when you are actually working on those problems because you are, you are not alone and you are surrounded with people in the risk department, maybe people in the engineering, people who sort of has that financial background that can help you um, and prepare you for the sort of, uh, for what is coming. Uh, but it, it may take longer uh, than you anticipated at the beginning. Uh, I think that even if the domain um, may be foreign to you before you are, uh, you are certain that you need to go down that road, I think it is still a very worthwhile learning experience that uh, you end up um, leaving, leaving that area with something uh, that you didn't know before, and that's kind of rewarding. And I think one of the things that a lot of us mentioned is sort of expectations or you know, working with a lot of different people, um, but the best projects are the ones where you've got a great sponsor and, or, for that project, and oftentimes they're the domain expert. Um, and you're, you're in a good position where you're able to see things that maybe they would never have seen because they're expecting to see something. So it's a balance between partnering with someone who can answer all your questions or you know, provide new questions back to you. It's like, hey, why didn't you see this behavior? Um, you know, we thought we should, whereas you know, for me, you know, I haven't gained that knowledge yet, um, but you know, I'm seeing a totally different perspective um, because I don't have it. Uh, so, it, it's a balance between you know, picking up the pieces that you need in order to do the job, but uh, also finding the right people to work with on projects that you can make sure they're impactful because they're invested in the projects as well as domain experts. Great, thanks. Other, other questions? Yeah, there's Galen in the back. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can comment on your research infrastructure. Um, you talked a lot about the time you spend cleaning. You mentioned an experiment that you ran, and I'm curious. You know, do you use Optimizely or some other kind of you know infrastructure that's third party, or have you spent a lot of time building out a re research infrastructure? Um, yeah, so we have our own in-house research infrastructure. So that's something that we'd actually spent quite a bit of time on building out. Um, so it's pretty customized to Airbnb. Um, which definitely does make everything much easier for us. Um, so. Yeah, I think the first six months or so of my job was spent building infrastructure to do our jobs. Um, and I think that's probably pretty common, you'll find, um, especially when the data is very special. Like for Jawbone, it's very important that we ha like own our data. We, we don't want to send it out to another company. Um, so, and having control over the pipeline is really important so that if you know, you're consuming some information from upstream and something breaks, like you need to be able to have control over that um, and know who to, who to bug <laughs> on the infrastructure team. Um, yep. And actually building a really clean standardized data warehouse was a huge project that our team took on. And it's made a big difference for all of our analysis, making it much easier. So. It's also pretty much a never ending process. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we actually ended up yeah. building out a team to like maintain that. So we have a data engineering team now yeah. that's like responsible for that. So. Excellent. Other questions? Yeah. So 
I feel like for looking at a lot of job postings, it seems like a PhD is really strongly preferred or necessary. Um, and I was sort of wondering if you could comment on, you know, um, what percentage of your team is, uh, has a PhD? Um, what are important skills that master's students can build to, to sort of stand out in maybe like publications? Are those important? Um, uh, my team's 100% PhD, but it's not, uh, it's not necessary. It just happened that way. Um, Actually, that's not true. Our data engineer is, doesn't have a PhD. Um, I think it's a good group to um, draw from, just in general. It's, it's a group that is good at communicating. They're, they're good at really, really working hard on a, lo on a problem for a long time. Um, <laughs> but on the flip side, um, you have to make sure that people with those skills also have the ability to step back and look at a problem and scope it down to sort of like actionable items. Um, that was something that was really challenging for me when I transitioned from academia was, I, you know, I got this really messy data set and was like, oh my God, this is going to take me like a year just to do the research to like know what method I should apply and no, you have two weeks. Um, so being able to prioritize um, while also having all of those skills that you gain in a, in a PhD program. Um, but I think like you can certainly go through a master's program like this and get all of the actual foundation that you need to do a data science job. Um, it's just that there's so many PhDs out there that are like, I would love to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> please hire me. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a PhD. Um, I did an analytics master's program. Um, there were 30 of us in our program. I, it was the first class of Northwestern graduates. Um, and I think everyone had at least two job offers, uh, or almost everyone did. Uh, there's certainly a lot of people out there looking for your s skills. Um, uh, the biggest differentiator, I think, for us was projects with real stakeholders, uh, because it gives you a lot of those skills in terms of prioritization and scoping projects that really make impact and um, talking about the impact your project had. It's not just about the model or the data cleaning. It's about what did, you, what did it do after all that? You know, what you know what you know the the impact in risk or you know the efficiency and productivity you know your uh, review rates went up or it's talking about what you did and what what it did after that um, and you can get those experiences um, before you you know have a full-time job because there is so much data out there and if you say you're willing to you know do an internship or you know something like that there's there's lots of people that are looking any other thoughts on the PhD versus I guess that uh, for for Cabbage for for my team um, there is only one who is not a uh, who who doesn't have a PhD. It wasn't certainly an intentional choice, I should say, but it um, it sort of ended up like that because those were the usually the group of people who were applying, and that's the sort of uh, resume pool that we were reviewing. Um, it wasn't intentional, but I, I would like to open a parenthesis that um, what I consider is if you have a master's versus uh, versus somebody else has a PhD, you have to sort of they have uh, they have been in working with data, uh, trying to solve similar maybe predictive learning problems for for a longer time uh, than a master's students. So you need to sort of you need to have. Um, you need to have done something to compensate for the loss of uh, loss of the uh, time or the gap in between, and that can be compensated through a number of ways. You, you may have done some internships. You may have uh, gained a relevant industry experience. Actually, I would um, I would prefer industry experience to a PhD because of uh, some of the reasons that uh, uh, that have been mentioned before. Um, Academics are very sort of focused on a specific problem and they are trying to sort of go deep and try to be expert for that particular aspect of the problem. Whereas in industry, you need to uh, have a lot more flexibility to sort of to changing priorities, to fast pace, uh, the sort of uh, to a number of different uh, uh, projects thrown at you at the same time. So you have to you have to have that kind of flexibility and you have to realize that there's a, there's a deadline uh, that you need to finish those things by. Uh, industry kind of prepares you in that sense that you need to 
okay, if I solve this problem uh, with maybe 80-20 80, 80, rule, like if I solve this problem 80%, I, that should be good enough. It may not be good enough to publish your work in an academic setting, but it, uh, it is good enough to have the first version of your solution for a problem in an industrial setting. So I think that um, there's certainly, uh, there are certain ways that you can compensate for, uh, for the gap in, in terms of the time that someone has spent uh, working, uh, working on similar fields. Yeah, my theory is that people have hired PhDs because that really was the skill set that was out there for a long time. Now we're mm -hmm. seeing the rise of masters and other kinds of data science programs. And so I think that's going to be, a, the balance will change yeah. over time. We have also seen, and like with my peers, uh, the people who had work experience in any industry um, had, you know, an advantage going into transitioning their skill set. Um, and so, you know, the way I see it is, a lot of people, I work, I'm also the youngest on my team, which I actually think is a bigger differentiator, but then being the, um, the only woman, I'm the youngest by like, 50, I don't know, a lot of years right now. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's about experience, because uh, a lot of times you're getting put in positions where you're working right with um, you know, the sort of top tier execs um, right away. And so bringing in PhDs that I've had long experience you know, working with people outside of just the normal like cadence of, you know, go to school, take your tests, um, you know, go on vacation, come back and do the same thing. Uh, it, it, that's an in, in industry experience as well. It's not just about, um, you know, doing data science from your first day out of college. Uh, there is a lot more out there and uh, it's valuable. Um, you know, you should never, I, I was able to spin my product uh, management and design experience into a great part of my, who I am as a data scientist. Other questions for this brilliant panel here? Right back there. Um, I have a question about um, those of you that have transitioned from academia into industry. And some of you answered parts of this, but um, I work with like a data science team. They're all PhDs. Um, we work really, really slow. So we pick a problem, we're like, this is interesting, and then we work on it, and at the end, there's a piece of software that comes out but it takes us months. And I think if we're running some sort of company, it would fail miserably as quickly as possible. And so one of you pointed out that when someone emails you, they're sort of expecting a magical answer to that question. And the few times I've dealt with people in industry or when we've consulted with people in industry, they're expecting something like that. And we go, hmm, I could, we could easily keep reading papers for a while and trying a bunch of things and it could be months. So how do you make that transition from working in a certain mindset to a different situation where you're expecting a result very, very quickly. Um, let's see, I don't know. I think it's just through experience. Like you learn to quickly, you know, the set of things you could look into is like huge. You have to kind of pick the area that you're gonna start with and that's probably where you're gonna end up in and so what, one thing that I was missing at my first job was a person who had enough experience with the full set of problems to be like, yeah, look over here. Instead, I was like, oh, I'll randomly pick something. <laughs> um, so I think like having a, a good, you know, it's kind of like having an advisor, having a, a good mentor or like manager to help guide how you spend your time is a big help. Um, and then just trying to like narrow down the scope of any project. Um, <laughs> I think like all, you know, anybody with natural curiosity wants to like follow things to the end. But most of the time what happens is you have 10 problems you're trying to solve, you get to solve like two of them, like pick, prioritize, and then just like try to get those done. I think also if you're in a company that has a bunch of stakeholders who need answers quickly, then that kind of forces you to move quickly. Yeah. Um, so you kind of learn by having some really prominent deadlines and also having people around you to help prioritize yeah. and figure out, it's again kind of comes back to this 80-20 rule where you know, you never, if you're finishing problems to like that level of detail, then that's probably not the best use of your time. Like you probably yeah, got most of it out. a question to the panel? Is this yeah. allowed? Do you guys <laughs> yeah. use any kind of like, so um, software teams often use like agile development um, process or just some way of kind of like 
assigning points to tasks and that in that way like your team always has like as much as work as it can handle or whatever um, I'm curious if you guys we tried it one time it failed miserably um, it turns out it's really hard to know how long a project is going to take at the beginning. You need to know the answer at the beginning to know how long it'll take. It's just like this, yeah, like what, how, do you, how do you guys plan your work on your teams? What we usually do, for instance, uh, in my current role is uh, whenever we are um, uh, starting a project, we usually work on a what we call a design document uh, where we sort of um, uh, lay out very clearly what the what the observation points are going to be, what the target that we are going to shoot, uh, shooting, what we are uh, shooting for, uh, what will be the components, are there any except, uh, exceptions to it, are there any exclusions that we are making, any road blockers, data issues, and so on. And it's, it's a very sort of well-documented, um, uh, well-documented at the beginning, it sort of helps us uh, see the future because when you have uh, laid it out to that extent with all the details, and you cannot all, always know all the details at the beginning, that's why it's an evolving document, uh, but at least it's sort of, if you, have, uh, if you make it as detailed as, as possible at the beginning, it sort of tells you what are the uh, components that I need to solve uh, to solve the entire problem before even starting solving the problem, and it sort of helps you prioritize, okay, we can start with these uh, first components, first three or four components, and then the others can wait, or how the dependencies in between uh, are going are gonna to emerge and so on. And one of the biggest challenges has been around the data. I'm sure that you, you, you all would agree that whenever you are starting planning about a project, I think that at least for, in my experience, the biggest uh, challenges in terms of laying out a timeline is related to the data and all the data issues that you don't know that you are gonna run into, uh, which is very hard to sort of, uh, to know in advance. Those are the sort of, those are always the factors that change the timelines because you didn't anticipate them in, uh, at the beginning and you kind of run into those issues as you, as you make progress. I think that's the biggest part. But having a design document early on also, uh, keeps everyone on the same page so that you don't have to have the same conversations back and forth. Right. Oh no, this is what we agreed on. Oh no, this this is what I was expecting. It sort of puts everybody on the same page so that nobody has um, has um, upsetting moments, I guess, at the at the end. We, we do the exact same thing where every project is, has a document that specs out what are the questions we're gonna answer, what are the data points, what's the highest priority question to answer. Um, and then we'll go through and say, well, what's our kind of approximate estimate of how long this will take? And then yeah. let's add a couple days because <laughs> that's probably what it's going to take. Huh. Um, and I think that's actually a big part of like, you know, when people are first starting out, kind of talking to them about how long things will take and kind of learning yeah. about how long things will take. That's so. interesting. One, one last question back there. Yeah. And, and you, okay. One question back there, and then you'll be the last question. I, this, we could go on for a long time, I can tell already, but I think our time is, is running out. We'll be, so I'm wondering, what's something that you now know about data science that you wished you'd known when you were starting? I definitely, personally, I did not know that it takes so much time to extract and clean data. Because <laughs> when I was in school, somebody gave me a pretty clean data set, which I analyzed and I focused mostly on the statistical methodology and improving the models. but. Um, I was really like surprised to see that probably 70% of my time goes into extracting and cleaning data. Yeah, we have a colleague in computer science who did research on this, and 70 to 85% yeah. of the time of data scientists goes into cleaning and munging the data. For me, I would actually say it's sort of the opposite, because I'd worked with a lot of like uh, pretty low-level data sets. I, in working for small businesses, I did you know a little bit of accounting, a little bit of inventory, so I, I had messy data, a lot of it. Um, what amazed me is how much impact you can make with what seems like a simple answer. Um, a lot of, like, we're right at the beginning of the things that can be done. Um, and there are so many opportunities where, you know, people are amazed when you give them an average 
Uh, and so, so when you go a little bit more than that, like, you know, and you just, you make sure your framing is right and you, it's aligned with what, you know, that person's looking for, you can totally change, you know, what they're going to prioritize for the next six months because of a, a, what might seem like a pretty simple answer. It doesn't take, you know, the most advanced black box modeling. Um, but you can provide value um, very early on and then only build on that. Any other thoughts on this one? Yeah. I have just one more. I mean, I think one thing that I didn't realize, and maybe this is partly because I came straight from school, is actually the importance of relationship building. Uh, so you're going to have to be communicating data to people. You're going to have to be hoping that they'll take your advice, right? And so a lot of what you're doing is like being a great partner um, and really helping people. And so I think that was something that I just had not anticipated. And so I think also being in a place where you really like the people you're working with and really respect them is hugely important. Great. OK, why don't we take our last question. Um, you guys mentioned that um, the field is always changing. There's new tools, no pr new programming languages, new algorithms. What are some strategies that you guys use to stay current in the field and kind of like stay on top of things? Um, yeah. I don't know. Meetups are great. Um, I go to Strata like conferences. Um, like honestly, just like reading through Stack Overflow, which is I want to say like 50% of what I do all day. Um, <laughs> I don't know how people did their jobs before that existed. Um, you come across just like random things, and you just follow the thread, kind of like going through a Wikipedia cycle. Um, yeah. Um, we tried to institutionalize this at Airbnb, so we have a weekly learning lunch. Uh, where someone on our team will present a topic that maybe they have some expertise that other people don't. And then we also invite outside speakers from different companies and from yeah, different places. So that's kind of how we institutionalize, making sure that we're staying current. Um, and we also are starting a journal book club, too. So, Vesela, you'd be happy to do that. <laughs> And I just challenge myself to maybe use a tool that I'm less comfortable with when I come into a new problem. And so it's like, well, I'm going to have to learn a new package, and I can do it in the tool I'm more comfortable with or one that I'm less. Um, you know, maybe not for the ones that I need in two hours. Um, but when I, though, one of the things I'm really excited about working with DataKind is being able to do projects outside of my uh, my day to day. And so definitely there for me, the priority is you know to learn to not just learn on a data set that you know comes with R, um, but to learn on you know real data and real problems. Um, but uh, sort of in a more safe environment because it's it's more collaborative. I would like to add. Um Maybe from a different perspective to your question, uh, I think that uh, conferences, meetups, um, and all that are very useful. I, I read a lot of blogs also for the people that I uh, that I know and trust their sort of their expertise. But other than that, I think one of the uh, challenges and also very important things to consider is um, not just staying on top of what is happening but to also have the hands-on ex experience with them because uh, you are all, always in a situation where you need to, if you have a tool that you like, you always have to negotiate with someone to convince them that they need to prepare the infrastructure and the platform for you to be able to use that platform or tool or language or whatever that might be. Uh, the fact that it is out there and uh, you know how to use it doesn't uh, doesn't make any difference if you you don't have access to it to do uh, to do the uh, to do your job and to do the things that you need to get done. But if you have um, there's a lot of open source uh, open source software that you can download and so on. So instead of uh, saying that oh I heard about this uh, amazing tool that uh, claims to run, I don't know, run these jobs uh, like in order of magnitude faster and so on. It is a different conversation if you tell them that I actually tried uh, this new language or tool to solve this problem and I get a order of magnitude speed up. That's a different conversation and I guarantee you that it's going to be a lot more convincing to sort of uh, convince whoever that might be your boss or stakeholders that uh, it is better that they invest in having that platform set up for you so that you can do a lot more pre productive at your work. I want to say thank you so much to all five of you and to Eric and Paul for great Thank you so much.
Thanks for coming, and don't forget that you'll get email from Bayes Impact by the end of the week. <laughs>